back to our our schedule of events uh, as you're finishing up uh, your luncheon. What a wonderful luncheon! Thank you so much. Uh, really uh, a healthy, healthy, healthy food, and I hope uh, certainly will be an opportunity to sustain us through the rest of the afternoon. Uh, this is our time to uh, recognize outstanding individuals and organizations uh, who have practiced sustainability on a daily basis and have done something significant and outstanding that is deserving of special honor and recognition. So at this time, uh, and certainly, uh, this is something that was started by uh, the Mayor's Sustainability Commission uh, in, in a way to uh, continue to keep this, uh, this issue of sustainability before the public. And we uh, present annually the Sustain the Rock Awards, and this is our time to recognize these individuals. So I'd like to, at this time, inter introduce uh, uh, Neil Gillespie, who is the Chairman of our Sustainability Commission. Neil? Hi, I'm Neil Gillespie, Chair of the Sustainability Commission, which meets every fourth Friday of the month at the Willie Hinton Center. And we really, really, really would like for everyone to try to come and join us. We have committees covering a wide range of sustainability throughout the city. And input and participation is always appreciated. Any questions, please look us up on the webpage. Anyway, so the Sustain the Rock Awards is voted on by the Sustainability Commission. It's by nominations that are given in uh, from all over the city. We've narrowed it down to five this year. Now I'll go ahead and start it off. Uh, when I announce your name, please start walking up. So our first one is for a volunteer organization, Essential Arkansas Master Naturalists. <laughs> Arkansas Master Natural Ma Master Naturalists are a core of well-informed volunteers that provide education, outreach, and service dedicated to the beneficial management of natural resources and natural areas around our city. Central Ar uh, CAM, as we call it, was formed in 2006 as Arkansas's first naturalist, master naturalist group. In its first decade, CAM has partnered in any tw with 25 local nonprofits to provide 57,000 hours of volunteer service valued at over a million dollars. Just a couple other quick points on this. Many of the group's partner organizations are limited budgets and rely on volunteer help. For example, the Audubon Society, which has been fortunate to have CAM expertise and dedication. Over the years, uh, CAM has led miles of trail building, eliminated dozens of acres of invasive sp species, and assisted in environmental education programs. Other partners include Wildwood Park, for the arts, the Hillary Clinton Children's Museum, and Pinnacle Mountain State Park. I'd like to introduce, uh, give our volunteer award to Central Arkansas Master Naturalist. Our next award goes to large business. It's a business which uh, um, I'm very familiar with every morning because I get my coffee there. Boulevard Bread Company. Two women buy a restaurant, and right now they have four locations, serve well over 300 people a day, have 66 employees. They're one of the first businesses in Little Rock to go green. Christina? To go green, they recycle their glass, cardboard, and plastic that's picked up three times a week. All of their leftover food goes to the food shelter. They source as much as they can from local farmers and dry goods, their, their, their food, their, their uh, cutting boards and so forth. And also, they reuse all their containers, so they have zero, trying to get to zero waste. And I can say that they also are using straws only on an on-demand basis. So. If you want one, you gotta ask for it. They're not gonna give them away. So, the, another great thing about Boulevard is how they support local craftsmen. Every Christmas, if, you, if you've ever noticed, that they do have a couple of crafts Sundays where people can come in and buy all their Christmas gifts from local craftsmen in the Little Rock area. So, my friend, Christina Bashan, thank you.
Our next award goes to medium business. Hangers Cleaners, a bachelor's best friend since I don't know how to iron. <laughs> Let me find you here real quick. Hold on one second, hangers cleaners. Hangers cleaners is the first and most consistent environmentally friendly cleaners in Little Rock. They are the first dry cleaner in Little Rock to use CO2, hydrocarbon, and wet cleaning. Following the recommendations of the EPA Design for Environmental Programs, they recently converted their lighting to, at one plant and all their stores to LED and upgraded the steam boilers to, and air compressors to the most energy efficient models available. Hangers Cleaners is a participant in the Institute's Hanger Recycling Program, which recycles over 30 million hangers a year. Hangers Cleaners is responsible for 150,000 hangers a year uh, recycled by the customers bringing them back in their little caddies that they get. Here's a good thing, another good thing about hangers. Each year, they repurpose thousands of donated coats for coats for kids. Last year alone, they repaired and cleaned for free 11,000 coats that were distributed to kids and those needed. <laughs> they, they offer a delivery program, which of course cuts down on, on fuel for us. So from our friends at Hangers Cleaners, thank you very, very much. Nathan Kelch. Nathan Kelch started the, are you here Nathan? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. Come on. Ever since he started the re director of Recycle Bikes for Kids, Nathan has put his heart into improving and growing a program of maximizing its impact. His desire to make a difference in his hometown of Little Rock brought him back here from DC. And under his leadership, that organization has expanded, built productive partnerships, organizations, and opened new locations. Sustainability is about protecting the environment, advancing the equity and economic resilience. Keeping the spirit of Bikes for Kids, Nathan has been making a conscious effort to improve the program and does justice in all these areas. In environment, as director of uh, Bikes for Kids, he has represented Little Rock, Arkansas, and more bike for Friendly communities are great for health, environment, and community. Through equity, both through kids and adults, earn a bike program, Nathan has helped people of all walks of life the means of empowering themselves through volunteer service. For kids, it provides a first step for, to being free, taking on responsibility, having fun, regardless of their social economic lives. For adults, it provides a free means to access the community build a sense of contribution, and create a partnership. For our friend Nathan, congratulations. And finally, the IT department of the city of Little Rock. Man, we appreciate you. The information technology department provides critical data, communication, and network infrastructure for the city of Little Rock departments. It began to upgrade the physical service to virtual services with the anticipated reduction of UPS power shortage while increasing the speed and productivity. Here's a few things he did. Initially, Little Rock had 103 physical servers. Upon completion into virtual service, they lowered the, the power level utilized, decreased from full capacity to 40% of what it was using, resulting in a 60% reduction. IT is now managing six servers instead of 103 and has 221 virtual servers of which 69 were added in 2017. The last review of our power reflected only a 4% increase over the past three years. There's so much more to say, but we greatly appreciate you. Thank you for being here. And that's it. I greatly appreciate y'all. Please share and come by our meetings the fourth Friday of every month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Neil.
Thank you very much, and congratulations to all of the winners, and certainly an opportunity to uh, look forward to next year uh, in terms of nominations. So you all be thinking about those people out there in organizations that are so deserving of this kind of recognition. We want to continue to uh, uh, elevate this issue, and that's one of the ways we can do it. it now it's my time to uh, welcome our special guest, uh, Mayor Ted Wheeler of Portland, Oregon. And like uh, many in this room, Mayor Wheeler comes uh, to public service from a background of volunteerism and public service. He's in his second year as mayor, and he also served previously as the chair of the Multnomah County, uh, uh, which is a county executive position similar to what we have here in our county. And previous to that was the, uh, or in between that was the Oregon State Treasurer. Uh, as an Eagle Scout with an economics degree from Stanford, and an MBA uh, uh, from Columbia and a ma and Master's of Public Policy from the Kennedy School at Harvard, Mayor Wheeler is continuing Portland's legacy of leadership in protecting the environment. Uh, he recently announced uh, their commitment as the city of Portland to meet the community electricity needs with renewables by the year 20, with 100% renewables by the year 2035 and to move all remaining energy sources to renewable ones by 2050. I'm not going to steal too much of uh, Mayor Wheeler's thunder, but in 1993, Portland became the first U.S. city to create a local action plan for cutting carbon. Their 2015 climate action plan builds on the accomplishments to date with ambitious new policies, fresh research on consumption choices, and engagement with community leaders serving low-income households and communities of color to advance equity through the city's and county's climate action efforts. He understands why it's important that we're all here today and why we go out and spread the word that we do. Uh, in saying in an article that I found about this on the internet, uh, he said, don't, we don't succeed addressing climate change by government action alone. We need our whole community government, business organizations and households to work together to make just a transition to 100% renewable future. If you would, please give me a warm southern welcome to Mayor Wheeler's first time visit to Arkansas and to Little Rock. Welcome, Mayor Ted Wheeler. Well, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. And thank you, all of you, for having me here. I, I feel extremely welcomed here and extremely well fed. And uh, to our friends who are running the composting program, I'm sorry to say I've left you absolutely nothing. <laughs> that chocolate cake should not be composted. So, one of my great pleasures being a mayor in this country is that, like Mayor Stodola, I get to go around the country and I get to talk about the things that we're trying to do and uh, the successes we're having, the challenges that we are confronting, the mistakes that we've made. And as mayors, we get it that, that we need to learn from each other, we need to push each other, we need to challenge each other. And I see that as part of the calling and part of the responsibility of being a mayor anywhere in this great nation. And while I had never been to Little Rock before, uh, it's been high on my list. And people have said of the southern cities, when you go to Little Rock, you're going to feel right at home. And I can't tell you how true that actually is, standing here on this stage. You know, Portland is, is very similar to this. If you just took a picture of me standing here in front of this river, in front of the bridge with the trees around us, uh, a multimodal transit path, uh, active transportation, a jogging path right beneath me here, uh, this is very familiar. And the issues that you're talking about here at this conference are issues that I see as being extremely important. So thank you uh, for that, and I want to acknowledge right up front that the work that Little Rock is doing here with your roadmap to 2020, it is exceptionally important work. And I encourage you to continue to work together, support your elected officials, support your mayor, support your nonprofit organizations, your private sector businesses that are working hand in glove to make this a success. Little Rock 
is embracing exactly the right kinds of strategies. Uh, I'm grateful that you didn't give me just another piece of paper. You gave me a sham wow, <laughs> which I can take home, and my spouse will definitely appreciate that. So I want to start off by giving you a frame of reference. This discussion, the debate really, around climate change usually takes place on what I think is a very limited spectrum. Instead of talking amongst ourselves and challenging each other to figure out how we can solve our climate challenges, uh, we often end up talking instead about whether climate change exists. And if it exists, do people contribute to it? And unfortunately, in that raging debate, and by the way, uh, from my perspective, the debate is over, and I'll get to that in a minute, but with that debate raging all around us, we forget to talk all too often about the tools that are at our disposal to actually be able to address the underlying problem. And that means enlisting the strengths of the market and the economy and the private sector to be able to meet our climate action goals. And that's going to be a theme throughout my comments today. And the reason that's a theme in my comments today is there is no community in this country. I don't care where you are. I don't care what the politics are. I don't care about your history or your traditions or your social ethos. There is no place in this country that should not be adopting some significant number of the types of strategies that you here in Little Rock have already chosen to adopt, if for no other reason, if you're not a believer, then because it's good for your economy, it's good for your businesses, it's responsive to market demand, and oh, by the way, you're going to save the planet and humanity in the process. So, given the constraint, by the way, I talk too much, so you don't want to clap too much because I will probably run long anyway, even though I have a staffer here in the front row who, Michael's sole job today is to throw stuff at me if I go on too much. So I want you to know my perspective and I want you to know where I come from. So there's two foundational statements I want to make, and you need to know this about me to give you context. Combating and reversing the impacts of climate change, those are the number one policy issues confronting us globally. They are the most significant. I believe what is at stake, and I believe based on science, data, in fact, I believe what is at stake is the very future of our planet and the very future of humanity. So you need to know that first of all. We created this mess and it's up to us to get ourselves out of the mess. And we can, and we can. And so uh, if I seem dour at all, please understand, I'm actually very optimistic we just need to get our act in order and get moving, and we need to do it quickly. The second statement I want to make is this, and I've hinted at this already. There is this constant refrain in the mass media and uh, through social media that if you adopt these kinds of climate strategies, including all of the kinds that were discussed today by the mayor and the panelists, and others, that somehow that's going to come into conflict with your economic prosperity and your household prosperity. I'm told people don't swear in Arkansas, so I won't say what I usually say here, <laughs> but I'm going to call baloney on the table on this particular issue. Uh, in fact, you can grow your economy. And I would even argue, if you're not in the green game, you are leaving economic prosperity on the table that you are not going to participate in as a result of your absence from the green economy. So we have a uh, 
opportunity to reflect on one example today. Uh, McDonald's, how many people here eat at McDonald's or take your kids there because you get dragged there by your kids? Uh, McDonald's, and I don't mean to be rude, but um, you know, I don't take my family there and I don't let my daughter eat there and that's my personal choice. McDonald's is not noted for being a particularly socially conscientious company, although in recent years they've really stepped up their game and we should applaud them for that. But they announced their own climate action initiatives a couple of weeks ago, and it raised a lot of eyebrows. People said, wait a minute, did you say McDonald's? Yes, McDonald's. They have two primary goals. And while I have long been a critic of McDonald's, I'm here today to applaud them and acknowledge them and lift them up for doing the right thing. They've said, number one, they want to partner with their franchise franchisees to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from their restaurants and from their corporate offices, and their goals are ambitious. They're going to reduce their greenhouse gases by 36% by 2030 from their 2015 base year. They're gonna measure it, they're gonna target it, and they're gonna report out to the public on their progress. Pop-up. Are they doing this out of the goodness of their heart? I don't know, and I'd like to believe there are actually people uh, at McDonald's who've really been pushing for this and championing it and saying, come on, we got to get on, we got to do this. This is, this is what we need to do to protect our environment. Um, you know, the young people who come in and play in our playland, they're our future consumers, and they're going to have different attitudes and different views about this kind of thing. Um, we need to get on the ball. I would argue... Personally, just having spent enough time on Wall Street and in that environment, uh, as the mayor mentioned, I was the state treasurer for six years. There's days when I wish I could scratch my eyeballs out as a result of some of what I've seen and some of the people I've had the opportunity to meet. Um, they're very ROI oriented. They're very bottom line oriented. There's a market play here. I believe that personally. I don't have the facts. I could be wrong. The second thing they're doing, though, that I want to acknowledge as even a more important step, and one that uh, I think was bold on their part, courageous, and deserving of praise, is they've said it's not just going to be about us anymore. If you want to supply McDonald's, if you want to be a supplier, if you want to be a producer in their operations, you're also going to commit to these goals, including a 31% reduction in emissions intensity all across their food supply chain by 2030 from their 2015 goals. So they're doing two things that all of us can learn from here. Number one, they're setting corporate standards for themselves and their own delivery structure. And number two, they're saying, if you wanna do business with us, if you want to be part of our supply chain, if you want to be in our orbit, then you're in too. And if you're not in, you're done. That's sort of a great framework for us to think about how these things can unfold. So to repeat, climate change is real. It's dangerous to our health. It's dangerous to the planet. And uh, we can utilize business and economics to help address it. So. I'm proud to be asked to come. Uh, the mayor could have asked any number of other people to come and stand in my stead, and I, I hope I do justice to this conversation today. Portland's known for a lot of things. Uh, we're known as being slightly quirky. I don't ever understand that. Uh, we're known for many of the same things you're known for, really good coffee, great beer. Uh, we have a thriving arts and culture community. Um, we don't necessarily like big. We like human scale. We like small businesses and entrepreneurs and maker spaces and, and interesting one-off opportunities. But what I'm here to talk to you about today, it's not donuts, uh, and it certainly isn't Portlandia. But I want to talk about the work we've done around climate change, environmental protection, sustainability, and livability. And I want to start by saying it's not a reputation that Portland has already had. In fact, if you go all the way back 
to the early days of the city of Portland. One of its nicknames was Stumptown. Stumptown. That's not a very good marketing play. Um, it was called Stumptown just by virtue of the sheer number of trees that had to be clear cut to accommodate the development of the city. And so um, while things have certainly changed since the 1800s, um, we're really very proud of the overall results that we've achieved. I am a firm believer that local government has to lead, both by example, and, and you heard some really good panelists talking about the work that's being done by the government of Little Rock. Why? Because government has to demonstrate a commitment before you can ask other people to lead. Government has to start and demonstrate that you can bring things to scale. Government sometimes has to be the incubator. And as those of you who are in the private sector understand, what happens at an incubator can be very messy. Sometimes things work out and you get a really good innovation. Sometimes you hit a brick wall and you realize, wow, that's not going to work. We need to do something else. But it's very important that we lead. And it's particularly important that we lead in a time when the United States as a country has pulled back from its acknowledgement and its commitment to addressing global climate change. I recently had the privilege of being in Chicago with Mayor Hidalgo from Paris and the mayor of Chicago and the mayor of Seattle and the mayor of New York and many others. And we talked about the importance of the Paris Climate Accords. And even if the United States is officially out of it by virtue of the fact that the federal uh, administration is not engaged on the climate change issue. We as cities all across this country, we're where the people are. The people don't all live in Washington, D.C. They live here. And in city after city after city after city around the country, Mr. The, Mr. the President of the United States, he's, he's done us a favor. He's done us a favor because he's galvanized us to work together, partner together, leverage off of each other, and remind people that as a republic, we were designed based on the power of the local community. And this is an opportunity for us to say, we're still going to do it, and we're still committed. So there you have that. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in Portland. And it's so fun to have the ShamWow here because a lot of this is stuff that, that we're working on. Uh, we're experiencing a lot of the, the same challenges. Uh, we also can't open pickle jars. And we see opportunities for us to partner. So while the challenge of, that, that is what you use this for, right? <laughs> while the challenge of climate change is more urgent than ever. Uh, our response isn't new. As, as the mayor indicated, uh, we introduced our first climate action plan in 1993, and we have actually revised the plan four times since then, and just uh, this last year, uh, we announced some new revisions to that climate action plan, including both our commitment to going to 100% renewable energy, as well as declaring that as we make that transition, it will be a just transition. And I'll talk about what a just transition is just a little bit later in my remarks. The good news here is the kinds of changes that we've made in our community to respond to the Climate Action Plan since 1993, they're all changes that if you didn't mention the words climate action and plan, they're still the kinds of things people would want us to do as a community anyway. Things like creating walkable neighborhoods and shopping experiences, restaurants, bicycle paths, investing in transit, safer sidewalks and crossings, active transportation opportunities, making our homes and buildings more efficient and more comfortable. These are things people want, and polling data reflects that heavily. So. Um, it's exciting for us to be able to do these things. Our climate action plan, and I brought a copy of it, I, I know people almost passed out when they saw me walking up to the stage with an inch thick folder thinking, oh my God, he's gonna go on forever. Um, there is coffee, by the way, stage right. 
Uh, this is our climate action plan in Portland. And it has, uh, as I say, 170 uh, specific goals in it. And uh, if you turn to the front page of the cover, uh, and by the way, you can get this online as well, the first part of the plan articulates the vision. And in Portland, we spend a lot of time around coffee shops uh, over excellent microbrew talking about where are we headed, what's the vision, what's the direction. And we came up with basically four primary visions. We want to be prosperous, we want to be connected, we want to be healthy and resilient, and we want to be equitable. By prosperous, we mean Portland and our surrounding uh, uh, county are going to have a prosperous and successful economy and people are going to be able to participate universally in that prosperity and green living wage jobs are going to be an intentional and important component of that prosperity and we're going to continue to be connected and that means the kinds of access to transportation strategies that you're investing in and engaging in here locally making sure that that bicyclists and walkers and people using transit have as many options that are easily accessible and affordable uh, as uh, absolutely possible in terms of health and resilience, understanding that homes and businesses, uh, the buildings need to be affordable, they need to be healthy, they need to be comfortable, uh, they need to be durable, and they need to be highly efficient. And we talk about the kinds of things in the community that can help us be healthy and resilient. That can be things like parks, that can be greenways, uh, I love the presentation, by the way, on the nonprofit that plants trees. We have sort of a, what I'll call a sister organization in the city of Portland, Friends of Trees, that works tirelessly to increase the canopy. Uh, for a lot of people, they drive down the street or they walk down a sidewalk or they visit somebody's home and they just say, wow, I love this. It looks great. This is the kind of neighborhood I want to live in. And they don't know anything or care anything maybe about stormwater runoff or urban heat canopies or anything else. But when you plant a tree, you're actually achieving your climate action goals in spades while providing the kind of livability and the look and the feel of a community that people increasingly say they want in an urban environment. People want forests in the city. And if you don't want people using automobiles, then you need those recreational opportunities, you need those greenways, you need those forest opportunities and recreational opportunities in close proximity so that people can actually enjoy it. And of course, the kinds of buildings, the infrastructure, the natural and human-made systems all have to take this stuff into account. And last but not least, in terms of the equity, uh, if we're gonna do climate action, we're not going to do it to people. And I want to remind you how we moved to a carbon-based economy. Who benefited and who paid the cost? Where do freeways get built? Path of least resistance. Where is that? Economically disadvantaged areas and communities of color overwhelmingly were the places where freeways were located, including in Portland, Oregon. Same with our big infrastructure. Same with our urban development strategies, which displaced lower income people and communities of color. All the way until fairly recently, by the way. And so now, as we think about this new economy and this new way of organizing around our climate action goals, we think intentionally and deliberately around all 170 of those specific strategies, who benefits who pays the cost, and how do we ensure there is equity? For example, um, if we are building green architecture, it's not just for rich people. We make sure that we have an affordable housing strategy that includes lower income people all the way down to 30% AMI. If you're a housing nerd, you know what that is. If you don't, just trust me. It means you are making a concerted effort to include everybody in the benefits. Because if you build affordable housing that doesn't include green technology, you are actually putting higher long-term life cycle and operating costs on the backs of the poorest people in your community instead of letting them benefit 
from these technologies. And you think about how you plan transportation systems and how you plan infrastructural development. Are you putting it in places where people can benefit? Are you providing equal access to things like transit? And bicycling can't just be for the people in the urban core where the real estate prices bear out the costs of that kind of infrastructure. You have to think about people who maybe don't have that opportunity because you want to engage them and include them in these kinds of processes. So we've proven that we can do this. Uh, Portland home use, and these are just some statistics right in the front of the plan. I just want to read you a few of them. Uh, energy use is 11% less than it was in 1990. We have over 390 eco roofs now located uh, in our city and 20 acres in total of rooftops. We use 29% less fuel on a per capita basis than we did from 1990. About 70% of our waste stream is currently recycled and believe it or not, that's still considered really good. Although there's a lot more that we think we can do in that department. Over 3 million new trees and shrubs have been planted in our city since 1996. And that's through our intentional revegetation work. Anytime we do any sort of a, a streetscape or redevelopment, put in sidewalks, that is always part of the play. We uh, have reduced residential garbage to the landfill in Portland by 35% since 2011. I'm going to check that box for a minute. 35% since 2011. And I'm going to talk about that because we had an interesting conversation around our table as we were discussing composting and the bags and a few other things. Uh, smart street infrastructure, lights, water, sewer, all of these things can be significant contributors. Uh, our solar energy systems have increased from a dozen in 2003 to well over 3,000 today. Obviously, uh, we are huge fans of transit and active transportation in the city of Portland. Uh, we've added and expanded four major light rail lines, the Portland streetcar, as well as 260 miles of new bikeways. Here's one that's kind of disappointing to me. Um, how many people here ride you know, on a regular basis or commuters? You ride your bicycles. So in this room, you have a much higher percentage. You are disproportionately well represented, you cyclists, here in this room today. Uh, even in Portland, which is Bicycle City, USA, where we make significant investments in infrastructure, uh, only about 6% of Portlanders bike to work today. And I am convinced that other than induced demand, you know, for making driving just such a horrific experience that, you know, grandma says, I'm done with it, I'm pulling the bicycle out, and here I go. Um, you really need to do the kinds of things you see out here. You have separated bicycle and pedestrian lanes, separated from traffic. There's a lot of people, you know, 6 to 15 percent, they really want to do it. They see people, they're driving in their car, and they're like, man, it's a beautiful day, that looks fun. But it's just too dangerous. I don't, yeah, I, I'm not going to do that. Um, but if you separate, you make those kinds of investments, you can go to six, from 6 to 15% really quickly. And that's an area where in the city of Portland, I think we were really good for a while. Then we sort of fell back a little bit, and now we're reengaging on that front to see if we can't get more people on bicycles. I loved the guy who was up here getting the award for invasive species. Um, this is something 10 years ago most people had never even heard of. Say, like, ivy? I love ivy. Plant ivy all over the place. It looks great. No, ivy. Ivy is the devil. <laughs> ivy is the devil. Um, the city's treated and managed invasive plants on over 7,400 acres. Uh, and parks and roadsides. And like you here in Little Rock, we rely really, really heavily on volunteer support to be able to do that. So I really appreciate, Mayor, you and others for acknowledging uh, the good volunteers and the nonprofit work that goes into that because ivy kills your tree canopy. And trees are, of course, are an integral part of both stormwater management and 
carbon reduction in the atmosphere. And therefore, invasive ivy, ivy is, is, and other species can really be damaging and contradictory to our, our climate action goals. Climate, or tri transit ridership has doubled over the past 20 years. Uh, we are now, we have over 250 green building projects. I love this facility. Mayor, did I say that earlier? I love this facility. Um, this is a really good reuse of an historic structure, a protection of the facade, uh, modernizing it, giving it lead gold status so that it is usable, workable, efficient, effective, and climate friendly all in one. And we're really supportive of those kinds of projects. And then of course, compostable materials. I wanna diverge from my notes for just a moment and tell you um, the discussions you've had today are very familiar to me and I just wanna go back and review a few of them. When uh, you know, the mayor and I were having this conversation about things like bags, and there was a young woman sitting towards the back of the room and she said, why are, why are we still using plastic bags? Portland banned the bag a number of years ago and it was very controversial. I don't wanna sugarcoat it. It was a leadership moment on the part of the mayor and the city council. There were a lot of people who just thought, okay, this feels a little prescriptive, right? You're now you're intruding into my, the way I buy groceries for my family. I've got a kid on one arm, a bag on the other. I don't need you telling me what to do. There was n no question that there was that kind of pushback. Well, here we are you know, some number of years later and it's just the way it is. Uh, my car has a bunch of bags in the back, which by the way are fabulous advertisements. So for those of you in the private sector, get in early on that one. Uh, it's not a printed bag. Uh, it's a bag that people hang on to if you're me for years. Um, people now actually prefer their bags because they realize, wow, you know, a, 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 a hemp or a canvas bag or whatever um, has handles on it. And it's bigger and it has a square bottom. And people are like, wow, my bag doesn't, you know, nobody's tomato sauce falls through the bottom of their bag anymore. That's like a slapstick comedy from the 80s. It just doesn't happen. Um, and everybody keeps the bags. And my wife has different size bags than I do. And she has more and I have less. And she has one that carries wine for obvious reasons. She's married to me. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, the, it, it is now the kind of thing where if you tried to take it back, you couldn't. The public now has adapted it. They support it. And the private sector companies started bidding against each other, the green grocers and such, to provide the best bags, uh, to provide discounts. This discounts are provided at the retail level if you bring your own bag. And uh, sure, if you're visiting from out of town and you just don't have a bag, they will give you a bag. Uh, it is hopefully a biodegradable bag and they will charge you for it. And you'll be the only person in line who's using a bag and everybody will sit there tapping their foot like this, looking at you. And that better not be me. I mean, I'll carry 50 things out in my hands before uh, I will go back to using a bag. Another example, curbside recycling, right? Curbside recycling. Uh, when that was first proposed, people are like, oh, that's cool, recycling. Uh, and so everybody got a great big blue bin for curbside recycling, and people would throw their newspapers and everything else into the recycling bin. And then people realized, wait a minute, you're taking the trash collection from weekly to every other week. And suddenly people felt like, wait, you're taking something away from me um, and they were a little less enthusiastic about the idea of curbside recycling when they realized that trash collection wasn't gonna be every week. Trash collection been every week since like, I don't know, 1852? Um, and all of a sudden, it's gonna be twice that span. And there was a lot of blowback to that. But once people started recycling, a funny thing happened. They liked it. 
and they started to realize, wow, I really was throwing away a lot of stuff I didn't need to. If that trash hauler only comes every other week, you're thinking long and hard about what can you get into that recycling bin and out of the trash can. And it proved to be sort of an aha moment for a lot of people. I want to be really clear. I'm not saying government knows best and you should cram this down the throats of the people you serve. But I am saying uh, the experience in Portland has been that once the recycling program was put into place, people love it and they support it. Then came the composting program. I'm so disappointed the composting guy is gone. I wanted him, oh, there he's in the back. Thank you. Because um, I wanted him to hear this. There was a tremendous amount of resistance to the composting program. I mean, just think about this. Now you've got the recycling bin, you've got garbage pickup every other week, and now you're telling people, and I remember this quote vividly, now you're telling me I gotta keep a slop bucket in my kitchen. <laughs> and um, so the resistance to that was fairly high. Um, however, once again, now that it's here, and we, we just have these big green roller bin things, so you've got your recycling bin, you've got your rolling bin every other week. And by the way, recycling and composting is weekly. Uh, trash collection is every other week. And, um, and you have a little <laughs> bottle container. Um, I had a young child at the time this program was rolled out with poopy diapers. Did I mention poopy diapers? We're all done with lunch, right? And the idea in Portland, Oregon, when it's 90 degrees in the summer and having poopy diapers sitting around in your garage for two weeks, for a lot of people just seem, hmm, how's this gonna work? Um, it works really well, is the answer. And again, I don't think you could take it back today if you tried. And that's why from 2011 to current, we were actually able to reduce that waste stream by nearly uh, 35 percent, which I, I think was uh, an important set of steps. Other things we're doing that I think are going to be, um, I feel like there's one more thing, Michael, I wanted to mention. Oh, straws. Straws. Somebody mentioned the magic word around straws. So uh, we are bringing a straw ordinance. Um, this is one where I got to tell you the private sector is way ahead of government. You go to a lot of restaurants today, and, and I think somebody even stood up and mentioned it in our, their comments. Um, yeah, I, I was at one of my favorite little diners the other day. It's a guilty pleasure I have. They have hamburgers and milkshakes, and I love them. They're great people. And um, they gave me this straw that was like pathetic. Like, I mean, it just wouldn't work for the milkshake. And I'm like, what is this thing? And they're like, oh, well, we're trying different brands of compostable straws, but we're finding out they're a little bit problematic with ice cream. And I'm like, well, you know what? In a lot of places, they don't serve straws with milkshakes. Just give me the milkshake and give me a spoon, and I'll take care of the rest. And uh, then I learned that there's like 10 different kinds of compostable straws, and then a colleague of mine actually gave me a permanent straw. It's like a stainless steel straw, or it's made out of something. I really don't know what it's made out of. But he said, uh, in another 20 years, restaurants won't give out straws at all. If you want a straw, you will just have your own straw. Um, you have, you know, when you put up the chart here and it had a like tornado thing going through the middle of it, okay, like my heart jumped right there. I was like, you have a what? And then I remembered, oh yeah, you guys have tornadoes here. You think about this. And so when you plan and you're thinking about community resiliency, you have to think about tornadoes. We don't. You know, we occasionally get a tornado, but they're probably nothing like the tornadoes you get here. Um, but we have the Pacific Gyre. Do you know what the Pacific Gyre is? The, the lady from the aquarium, if she were still here, she would know what this is. The Pacific Gyre is this man-made constellation of swirling plastic and detritus in the Pacific Ocean that's getting larger and larger and larger at an alarming rate. 
and a lot of it is straws. Think of the millions of straws that every single day in this country get thrown away. It's just like, you know, heavily carbon, petroleum-based, non-compostable, permanent product being dumped into oceans all around the world. Do you really need a straw that much? And I have come to the conclusion I don't. And businesses that are way ahead of us, because there's a lot of green businesses in Portland, have already said, you know what, you don't need a straw. If you want a straw, ask for a straw. And it turns out very few people do. And if you ask for a straw, they'll give you a recyclable one. And I think that's cool, and, and we're definitely moving uh, in that direction going forward. A uh, few more just brief things I want to touch on, and then I will finish, because the coffee has not been drunk, and I see there's still cake left over there. Um, the mayor mentioned the renewable pledge. The 100% renewable pledge. We're going completely to renewable energy in our city, throughout the city, the entire city, by the year 2050, with all electricity being converted to renewable sources by the year 2035. That is a very, very ambitious goal, and it requires us to partner with our utilities. We cannot get there without the utilities being actively supportive and aggressively participating in that. Uh, I supported the passage of a law in 2016 that required Oregon utilities to supply 50% of all electricity from re new renewable resources by the year 2040. That was a major expansion and extension of our previous requirement, which was 25% by 2025. The law, which was dubbed coal to clean, requires the uh, utilities to phase out their coal-fired plants entirely by the year 2035. Uh, I don't know the total composition of your energy uh, mix here, but in Oregon, coal is still very significant. I know that's antithetical to the image we have, but it also happens to be true. Uh, and in addition to that, we continue to work with uh, all of uh, our utilities. River access. I know river access is near and dear to your mayor, and, and I was pleased to hear about the, the river trail uh, that you're creating here. You know, like Little Rock, Portland is a city adjacent to a river. But we really need to engage people and bring people back to the river and encourage an active waterway. Our river literally divides our city, and it's been seen as a chasm between rich and poor, vibrant and not, um, white people in communities of color. And by reinventing our river, we call it our river renaissance, and encouraging more active use, kayaking, swimming, you know, not unlike Copenhagen's you know, world-famous uh, harbor baths, we're trying to create active space that draw people to the river. And we're using these development opportunities to also preserve and rehabilitate and protect the river environment. That includes the grasses, that includes the rocks, that includes the uh, riparian environment, that includes spawning habitat for endangered coho salmon and other species. So while we're creating these recreational and active opportunities for people in our community, we're also using it as a leveraging point to preserve and protect the environment. So it's not fish or people. What we want to do is have the opportunity to swim with the fish. That's the objective that we're trying to meet there. Congestion pricing. Um, I don't know, what's the traffic like in Little Rock? Mayor, do, do you have a, a big rush hour or not a big rush hour? Yes? No? No? All right, so uh, you will have a culture shock if you come to Portland because we have horrible congestion. We have horrible congestion. And our city is actually ringed by a series of highways. They're at capacity, our arteries are at capacity, and like Little Rock, lots and lots of people want to move to Portland, Oregon. And if you look at what consultants say is the future of our city in terms of congestion, uh, without all the details, it would just be a big picture of our entire metropolitan region painted in red. Every street, red. The future is bleak in terms of congestion. Not only does congestion really make people angry and generate a lot of calls to my offices 
in the offices of other elected officials, but it wastes time, it wastes money, it creates idling, it is a profound misuse of uh, carbon, and it leads to more pollution. And so we have to find ways in an environment where we're not going to build any more streets, we're not going to build any more freeways. Um, in, there, just, there isn't the land. Um, you know, I wish I could just say that as an altruistic value. There just isn't anywhere for it. So we have to work with what we've got. And of course, transit has a lot to do with that. But this issue of congestion pricing is now front in center in our community and we have supported an effort we have just voted to support the establishment of congestion pricing in our community boy you thought composting was conservative <laughs> congestion pricing opens up just a world of bigger questions do you remember when i mentioned equity every politician talks about equity and now i'm talking about pricing of what is currently a free asset, access to roadways, that raises all kinds of questions around equity and fairness. And we're wrestling with that question now. I don't have an answer for you today, but I just want you to be aware that as we try to achieve a climate action goal, reduce congestion, uh, it inhibits our economic growth, it inhibits our ability to achieve our climate action goals, we're running head on into our equity goal. And we will not allow our equity goal to be swept to the side for any purpose. And so when I come back someday, if you ever have the temerity to invite me back, I hope you do, um, I hope I can talk about that more specifically in terms of what we've done. Last project I want to talk to you about. We are a timber state. I mentioned all those paper bags we used to have in our grocery stores. Um, a company that several generations of my family worked for used to have their name printed on the bottom of every one of those bags. And it's maybe sort of a good analogy for the timber industry in our state. At its height in the 1970s, it employed about 75,000 people. Today, it employs about 25,000 people um, who make salaries in excess of what I would describe as a, a upper middle class wage. So the, the, the industry has really fallen off. Rural Oregon has really struggled with the demolition of the timber industry. And all of a sudden, this new technology comes around that shows the opportunity to marry loggers with green builders, architects, and environmentalists. And it's called cross-laminated timber. And I know many of you here have heard about it. Uh, my father, uh, as a young man, actually spent most of his time down the road in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I still remember going because I still have nightmares about those cockroaches. We just don't have those. I mean, we, we get dogs, okay? We get dogs. But the, uh, this promise um, is being exemplified by a building that the city council has now contributed to and that we will be building in Portland, Oregon. It's called Framework. It is the largest, tallest, all wood skyscraper in the United States of America. And it will also include affordable housing units. And the question really isn't, can we do it? We know the technology works because it's used in Europe. And the promise of CLT, cross-laminated timbers, instead of steel and concrete, components of which are often imported, uh, steel and concrete are heavily petroleum intensive, uh, all of a sudden we have the opportunity to use a renewable source, wood, that is actually an absorber of carbon. But even this isn't without controversy, because then the question becomes, all right, where are you getting the wood? And how is that wood harvested? Nobody wants to see a bunch of clear cuts of old growth timber to create a pilot project to support our climate action plan. Those things work at cross purposes. But we have found out in the process there isn't actually enough certified timber product to be able to build the building because the industry hasn't been developed. Well, why hasn't the industry been developed? Because there's no demand for the product. So all of a sudden we have this 
uh, the opposite of a virtuous circle. Maybe it's an unvirtuous circle. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just chicken and egg. I, I hate to use it, but there it is, chicken and egg. Um, we need to create a demand for sustainably harvest cross-laminated timber and get out of the business as much as possible of building with steel and concrete. And to do it, somebody needs to take some risks and show that the technology can be used and successful and appreciated, and we're doing that in Portland, Oregon. And I hope that you will take a good hard look at the work we're doing with our framework facility as that unfolds, and maybe at some point I or somebody else will have a opportunity to come back and share with, with you good folks here about our successes there. Um, so I want to finish with this. Uh, I'm going to finish exactly where I started because it, it, it bears underscoring. What is at stake here is not just another business development strategy. This is not just another livability strategy. This is not a wish list or some utopian dream of uh, a hopeful, fairly progressive politician, uh, again, we're doing these things because I believe the planet and humanity are at stake. And the next generation, I'm really pleased, by the way, to see some kids here. Are you from a school or which school are you from? I'm sorry, which one? The, we have the kids here from Central. Hi, can we give them a hand for being here today? The, uh, Yeah, th this is a generation that is going to view our progress or lack thereof with very critical eyes. They understand this issue in many ways better than older generations do. Um, they understand that if we fail to act, it's not us. We're not the ones who are going to pay the bill. They're going to pay the bill. So it is very, very important that we be successful. To be successful, that means we will have to collaborate. Mayor will continue to do that. We will continue to work together. We will continue to share successes and best practices, and we will leverage off of each other. We have to do that. Um, I'm so thankful to have been included in this conference. I'm so inspired by the work that you're all doing, and I'm very, very optimistic that we have a bright future ahead of us for generations to come. Thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, we have some questions. Are you good are you good with that? Can we run the... Uh, it depends what the questions well, are. Well, okay. We're going to run the <laughs> microphone around a little bit. Um. Mayor, thank you for that very inspiring talk. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of the things that Oregon and Portland are noted for is the passage of a deposit bottle bill. How has that benefited the city of Portland? How would you say it was received? And how can Little Rock and the state of Arkansas adopt something similar? Oh boy, <clears throat> the bottle bill has been a raging success. If anything, I don't think we have pushed it far enough. So the bottle bill was passed many, many years ago. It was the first bottle bill in the country. Uh, we had a fascinating governor back then by the name of Tom McCall. Tom McCall was a Republican, uh, but he was very much an environmentalist. Environmentalism wasn't a, um, uh, it wasn't a, a litmus test for political affiliation back in those days. It was just presumed. Um, the start of the bottle bill was largely because people were tired of seeing broken glass on the side of the road. It was garbage. And uh, so the idea was created to give people an incentive to take their bottles back to their store where they bought it or to a different store or to a redemption center. And it was very successful. And uh, it has been since expanded to include other kinds of containers like water bottles and other fluid containers and the like. Um, and again, it's, it's just one of those things that we do. I mean, it's almost, um, I actually forgot that there are places that don't have it. I mean, that's, it, it, it's been, for my entire life, we've just lived with it. 
Uh, stores know how to do it. Um, I will give you one cautionary note that might be helpful. I would encourage you to talk to the large grocery store chains, and we have several, I believe, of the same operators, or at least they have the same corporate affiliations in Oregon. Uh, with a growing homeless population, uh, we have, we have a, a very significant homeless situation in our city. Uh, redeeming bottles becomes of more value to people who are uh, on the outside of our economy. And a lot of people have complained to grocery stores that they don't like to be in close proximity to lots of homeless people waiting to redeem their bottles um, or they uh, fear for their safety or whatever else. And, and I'm not going to you know, debate the veracity or, or the ethics of that. I will just say it's a real issue. And so grocery stores have had to change the way they do redemptions. Uh, a lot of them have gone away from automated redemption centers to staffed redemption centers. And I don't know all the ins and outs of that, but I, I know it's a legitimate issue. Um, but in terms of how you do it, it's a net plus for people. Um, I would much rather redeem my bottles and get money back than have them go to the landfill or end up on the side of the road. I mean, for me, you, uh, economics is a powerful influence in my life. I'm on a public salary. Um, so 10 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents times 1,000, that starts to add up in my household. Uh, and I would encourage people to uh, engage in that way. It's been a very positive experience. I, I don't know any, Michael, you're from, has anybody said they don't like the bottle bill? I can't, I can't remember any point in my life where somebody has said it's something they don't like. It just sort of is. That wasn't useful advice at all, was it? Do you have a more specific question? Is there some aspect? So can I suggest something else? Um, the politician who moves that will be legendary. You, I, I'm not kidding. I mean, we're, we're 50 years, 45 years after Tom McCall, and people still refer to him as one of the greatest governors in our state's history in large measure because of this. And of course, he had other environmental policies he was known for too. Um, again, I, I think it's one of those things where 20 years from now, a mayor is going to be standing here or standing in another community if they don't have a bottle bill, and he's going to feel like I do right now. You're asking me, is the sky blue? Yes. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having uh, me. So one of the things that I think about when you're talking about some things that cities can do to really address a lot of issues at once is to reduce sprawl. So I'd like to hear about what Portland is doing and some advice that you might have to just build more compact cities. And also along the same lines, I um, read an article last month on The Guardian called Ungentrifying Portland. And when I read that, I was like, wow, that's like such a Portland thing <laughs> to be way ahead of the curve. So what, what does that really look like? And can you talk about um, how to build more compact cities that are also equitable. Yes, um, so I mentioned Tom McCall once, I'll mention him twice. So back in, and I don't remember the exact year, so nobody quote me on this, um, it was 1970 something. In the Willamette Valley, which is some of the most fertile farmland in the United States, if anybody hears from a farming family, it's type two soil, it's excellent. It all came from Montana in a great flood. So if you're from Montana, I'm really sorry, we love your soil, it's been fabulous. But the um, developers of the day wanted to create a new housing development in a community south of Portland, and it was right across the Willamette River, to the south of the Willamette River, and it raised everybody's eyebrows because it was seen as farmland and would always be farmland, and all of a sudden somebody proposes a large-scale development right in the middle of it. And so the governor and other leaders decided, hey, we need to protect 
our farmland. This soil, you can't get it back. I mean, it's, as I say, it's really rare and it's really precious and it's limited. And um, so they passed legislation that would allow for the creation of what are called urban growth boundaries. Literally, it's a circle drawn around large communities and Portland and some of its affiliated uh, local communities have this urban growth boundary around it and you may not do large-scale development outside the urban growth boundary, period. Years. And every a committee comprised of uh, a couple of dozen elected leaders from all those metropolitan governments get together and decide how to expand the urban growth boundary within the significant confines of state law that allows for both industrial and housing development in a very limited way. But for the most part, the reason I mention this is we made a decision in Oregon. And the decision we made was we were going to protect farmlands and we were going to protect wilderness areas. And in exchange, that meant inside the urban growth boundary, we were going to accept more density, more compact environments. We're going through what's called our 2035 planning process in Portland right now. We're all, almost at the end. And I have said that I support height, I support density inside the central city, along transit-oriented corridors, and in town centers. There are some areas that are more appropriate for density than others. I choose density in those areas. We will build denser, have more affordability, be closer to transportation, ensure that our communities are walkable and bikeable. We call them complete communities, meaning you have stores, schools, parks, recreation, access to nature, access to other attributes within a certain proximity. And we build our community intentionally with the idea that we're going to be closer. Ultimately, um, one of the goals is so that you don't need a car. I mean, one, one of the biggest impediments, obviously, uh, along with energy in households, is transportation. And so we try to make it viable for people to not have a car. Uh, is it controversial? Constantly. Constantly. There are always pressures to expand the urban growth boundary. Uh, there are always pressures uh, for people who say, yeah, I like the wilderness. Yeah, I like the farms. I like the fact that you can drive 15 minutes out of Portland and be in a completely natural environment. Uh, but I don't want density in my neighborhood. And so things like auxiliary dwelling units become controversial, infill becomes controversial, townhouses, duplexes, triplexes, those things come, become tr controversial. You have those same pressures here, I'm sure. That's not unique to Portland, Oregon. But the urban growth boundary really is unique. And we have a metropolitan regional government, which is one of a kind in America, that coordinates urban development and transportation planning at the regional level. So I'm one of 26 mayors who participates in that regional government, and we work collectively in the metropolitan region to determine how urban growth happens, where transportation is located, what the proximity between housing and employment are, and how we develop more complete communities within. And it's, it's been about a 40-year process. I feel like it works very, very well. Um, it's not without its pitfalls, but it's like the old Churchill statement. Um, you know, it, it's a, a horrible form of government, um, but not as bad as all the rest. Yes, sir. To, uh, initiate and but now are very uh, highly regarded. Um, I was curious about the greenways and the bicycles uh, infrastructure and uh, the controversy of getting that started and if you can talk to that. Yeah um, and unfortunately I'm not a real expert on this and there there are better people who could give you you know the down and dirty insider details but uh, bike sharing was invented in Portland Oregon but it was only implemented about three years ago. And that's really interesting that it took so long for it to happen. Um, my sort of layman's perception is number one, it wasn't prioritized. 
the way it should have been. Uh, number two, there weren't good partners ready to work with the city to make it financially viable. Now we have a fantastic program, Nike, uh, who's obviously one of our, our better known employers. Uh, they stepped up big time. Um, they've now worked with us to address issues uh, uh, like accessibility. So now we have tri tricycle bikes, we have hand bikes, uh, and they're working on deploying other bikes so that older people and people who maybe uh, have mobility impairments can also participate in the bike share program. Um, I, I'm sure the guy who wrote in on the bike could, could tell you spades more about this, but um, graffiti was a problem, vandalism was a problem. I forgot to answer the young woman's question about communities of color, but th this will segue into reminding myself to answer your question. Bicycles in Portland um, are symbolic. In some parts of the community, um, yeah, that's me. The uh, no, bi bicycles. No, what are you I looking at? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. I love that. The uh, yeah, it's like it's it's. Uh, somebody told me what that is. It's like a piece of farming equipment or from a grain mill or something. But yeah, it's a chain chain wheel from a bicycle. Now, that's good. I'm gonna steal that. It's good material. Um, <laughs> It was seen as another symbol of gentrification. And as bicycle paths moved into historic communities of color, particularly the African American community, there was a lot of um, justifiable historical anger. Because as I mentioned earlier with transportation strategies, with urban development strategies, there had been a very deliberate attempt on the part of government and community leaders to displace black people from the city of Portland over a period of many, many decades. And we don't need to go into that today, but trust me, I, I have spent a lot of time researching it, talking to people, looking at it. And so when the black folks were effectively displaced from our communities, their traditional communities, and their institutions were displaced from their traditional communities. And all of a sudden, the city started making these huge infrastructure investments like bicycles. The black community was like, but we were there for decades. And you not only didn't invest in our community then, you basically en masse displaced us from the community so you could build a freeway, so you could build a sports arena. Uh, so you could do an urban development, so you could build a new headquarters for a school district. And now you're putting in bicycle lanes and bicycle sharing. So it, it became a touch point on what's a really important and historic conversation that we're only having now in the city of Portland. And as mayor, I've, I've made it a leadership moment for me because uh, I have one foot in old Portland. I mean, my family's been there since 1852. And I have one foot in New Portland because I have a very clear vision of the future and how I want it to be an inclusive and equitable future for everybody who lives in the city. But the bike share, you know, being corporate, being new, being hip, being predominantly something that young athletic white people use, and that's just a demographic truth, um, based on the demographics of our city, it became a touch point. I didn't talk about the uh, prioritization policy that we've adopted in the city of Portland. In Northeast Portland, which is the heart of our historic African-American community, we are now intentionally bringing back family members who, were, who can demonstrate that they were actually economically impacted based on prior urban development. Uh, it's income-based, not race-based. I wanna be very, very clear. Uh, because there are fair housing laws. This is still the United States of America, and I still support the Constitution and those laws. But on an income basis in Northeast Portland, we're predominantly talking about black families. That is just factually correct. We are giving them first priority in those developments to come back and be uh, participants. We are working with them to help them qualify to be homeowners. We are very intentional in terms of development, contracting, and procurement to make sure that local uh, organizations, women, and uh, entrepreneurs of color 
get access to the development opportunities and the wealth that's generated through urban development. In other words, we're turning it on its ear. Instead of urban development being a tool to displace and harm and wrong people of color and lower income people, we're making it their best and first opportunity to actually restore intergenerational family wealth. And I can't sit here today and say it's been a raging success. It has all kinds of problems, as we expected that it would. Uh, but for me, this is about justice. And it's important that we be successful. There's a lot of communities around the country watching what we are doing. It's fodder on conservative talk radio. Um, yeah, they, but, but for me, this is just an acknowledgement that we have a history, and that history is pretty darn ugly. And uh, as we took homes away from families of color, we robbed them of intergenerational wealth that they would have had but for the actions of government and core institutional players. So uh, my view, and I say this very easily and freely, uh, is they deserve nothing less. Thank you all for having me. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, who's not super pumped? Wow. Yeah, okay. So thank you so much, Mayor Wheeler. You're just awesome. Um, just a few housekeeping things uh, to, just to wrap up. Uh, first of all, thank you, Central Arkansas Water. Did everybody find your little plant me? Yeah, pretty fun, huh? So they're awesome partners. Thank you, Central Arkansas Water, as always. And the summit team, I mean, uh, I don't do this by myself. I don't do this with just Faith. We have a lot of people doing a lot of things. So, uh, and where is Faith, by the way? Um, there's our other, there she is over here. Yay, yay, Faith. <laughs> Woo! And tomorrow's her birthday, so she gets tomorrow off, right? Okay. So um, I did want to just mention a couple of other things. One is um, uh, one of the things I know, John, you were pointing out about the bottle bill. And um, uh, Kathy Webb is with us. She's one of our board of directors, but also was uh, in the legislature. Um, and she sponsored bottle bill in 2007, and it crashed and burned. So uh, yay for all of us in this room wanting that, and it will take us, but many, many more. Right, Kathy? Do you, I mean, so we have to support that. That's not something, you know, locally, it just, it's just gonna take all of us. It's a, it's a legislative thing. So thank you, Kathy, for, for, for doing that then, and for, for being on our board of directors and helping us and uh, to, move, to move forward. So thank you so much. Um, as per usual, I also want to thank my bosses, or I wouldn't have a job. Hi, John and Ronnie. Yeah, yeah so um, the Public Works, um, I love, we, we, we love our Public Works. And we have John Landowski. He's our bike ped coordinator with Lindsay. Lindsay is in the house. Hey, Lindsay. Lindsay doesn't live here. She, she traveled to come here. Hi. So she is our bike uh, share provider and is gonna be part of the session. You guys may see, uh, there, there are two sessions you can choose from. They're both gonna take place in this room because of course they said it was gonna be a deluge and we wouldn't be able to get outside. It's now beautiful. So uh, you may actually have an opportunity to take a bike share. If you're interested in the bike share program, uh, John and Lindsay will be um, in this room and talk to you about that, show you the bike, answer any questions. Lindsay knows all, all about this. Living Waste Free, Faith uh, has, has, a, has a group and they're gonna talk about Living Waste Free. Um, and, okay. Okay, did you hear Faith? So uh, Living Waste Free is gonna be on this side of the room and Bike Share is gonna be on this side of the room. So if you uh, have some time to stay with us and, and to learn about those things, we would love for you to. It'll wrap up to two-ish. If you need to get back to work, we understand that as well. So another thing that we do every year, these crazy, awesome centerpieces. Um, so if you are interested in taking one of these centerpieces, uh, please do, all but the exception of two. Uh, Mayor Stola wants this one on his table, so uh, I'll be getting that one to his office. 
Um, and then Reed, our compost, Reed Admire, I don't even know where he went, he's probably scraping plates as we speak to, uh, to compost our leftover food. But those are his three containers on this table over here. He was uh, kind enough to bring them for us to show what, what you could have on your kitchen counter like I do. Uh, but th those are were out of his inventory, so I told him I wouldn't give his stuff away. Um, but any other crazy um, centerpiece, you are certainly welcome to take home with you. So, And thank you so much for spending time with us today. This was super important. And uh, Lindsay, did you want to say anything? You're good? Okay. Thank you all so, so very much for being here.